Welcome to Buckets, brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. This is your Futures Friday episode. We break down the best markets to find on NBA Futures. You can find all of the great content that we talk about here in the award-winning Action Network app. Best way for you to track your picks, you get up to the second information on where the bets and money are coming in on. You can get all of our daily show, the Buckets podcast is in there, along with Big Bets on Campus with college basketball season ramping up soon. Obviously, the Action Network podcast with the NFL playoffs continuing. All that and more, as well as Green Dot Daily, your daily betting show setting your betting agenda for the day. All of that's available in the Action Network app. Download it now. Very excited today. To be joined by Lockie Lockerson, Ken Barkley, you better, you bet. He has an awesome, awesome, awesome newsletter. Uh, Ken Barkley at the chalkboard. It's terrific. Like if you are a better, if you're listening to this podcast and you're into the betting this much, you absolutely need to be subscribed to it. It is phenomenal. He gives all these, like all, all of Ken's unfiltered, like, and very organized, but like detailed thoughts on so many markets. You have like this, this massive breakdowns this week of nhl awards i'm like how, yeah how are you up on these things ken yeah it's uh it's it's a lot of work it's a labor of love first of all it's great to be on i haven't, I haven't been on buckets since the finals last year i think it was the last time i was on yeah we were trying to figure out if the uh if the celtics were really going to do it and we i kind of talked myself into a long series and i wasn't sure who was going to win mercifully it was a long it was long enough that, that we catch that bet I ended up betting the Celtics too, which is a disaster, but uh, same. I, I got a lot of awards kind of thoughts percolating. I mean, NBA awards are, are they're hot right now. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. Some more that some are more decided than maybe they were two weeks ago in terms of the market, but there's, there's really cool stuff going. I think like title, there's cool stuff going on. I think conferences, especially the West. I think there's really interesting stuff going on with like, do you really think some of these pedigree teams are going to figure this out? So yeah, I mean, that's, this is what I do. This is what I, I'm here at the, I'm here at the workstation. We do, do a lot of work day and night on this stuff and, uh, and we try to make some money on it. I'm on Ken's show. You better, you bet with Nick Costas every Wednesday. You can catch me at four o'clock Eastern on that show on both terrestrial radio and the odyssey app as well they've got a great podcast i listen to it i listen to that show every single day it is phenomenal well, we appreciate you for we appreciate you coming on coming on every week for free well, that's it terrific a, that's a, it, that's i'm like doing it. it love the conversations so you talked about the awards we're going to talk about the most clusterfuck of all the uh, nba awards this season and that is sixth man of the year can you say that on buckets we can i can say, say, that, can on say buckets. that on buckets oh yeah, yeah. unfiltered buckets Listen yeah unfiltered right. buckets uh you know most most improved is a mess right now too Lori's moved to a favorite there but i'm so burned out and so tired of running myself in circles trying to figure out who's going to have enough wins to draw in the voters that i want to move to six man because again can we do I, most I think, improved after can we do it yeah. after i want to do them all I'm on, like, I'm in on the whole thing. We can talk about it. I don't we want to definitely piece. talk about it. This is what is happy Gilmore. I don't want a piece. I want the whole thing. You want the whole thing? Yeah, I so want the whole thing. We'll hit on those as well. So let's start six man of the year. Um yeah. Yeah, at show sponsor yeah. FanDuel. Yeah. Westbrook is still the goddamn favorite at mm. at minus 125. Yep. Pools plus 500, Brogdon's plus 500, Norman Powell plus 1600. Benedict Matherin is plus 2,300. Malik Monk plus 3,000. That's your top six. Let's start with Ru- with Russ. Ken, right. this is my take. All right. If it's Russ, I'm fine being wrong. I'm fine being wrong. Ha- okay, I'll lose the bet. I'll lose the money. I will give all up right. all the money I put in on six man of the year. Okay. I haven't bet Westbrook. I won't bet Westbrook. I right. will not bet this man. It's not a principal thing. I like Russell Westbrook. I am a Westbrook stand from early in his career. Can't stand him now. No one can. But I am okay being wrong about this. There is, I cannot see Russell Westbrook winning this award still. Your thoughts? Okay. Uh, I'm really curious what we're going to get at the end of the year from voters. And uh, and there's a lot of kind of layers of this. Uh, the first one, and I, I've... I've heard you talk about this award too. A lot of times we agree on stuff. I know we both were both kind of in on Norman Powell when the Clippers looked like they were on the way up and now they have, they were on the way up and now they're on the way back down big time. And we'll see kind of how that ends up going. I, I view this award, I think a little differently than you just, I view team success as almost the most important component of this. Hmm. And so like a a couple of stats that kind of bear that out, basically Um, in the history of the award, history of the award, no one has ever won going under 500. Never happened. 
ninety uh, percent of the winners won more than forty seven games, which is a lot of win. Like, look at the standings and project this out. You might get six teams this year, seven teams that win more than forty seven games. You know, you're going to have Boston, probably Philly, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Brooklyn, and then in the West, you might just have Memphis and Denver, and that's it. And we'll see how New Orleans plays, and that would probably be the other one. So, like you're restricting your list of teams that usually produce a winner to a really small number right away in a normal season. I guess that's like a key qualifier, right? So I think like I will always operate till I am proven wrong by the award that team success is a really big part of this. And when you look at the Mark Medina NBA.com poll, the media poll, I actually felt like that showed through in terms of who got votes and who didn't. Your two big vote getters there were Brogdon and Poole. And like, what do they kind of have in common? They don't share a lot of attributes. Poole starts a ton. He's, it's a mess to figure his case out. But I think what those two candidates share is like a belief among voters. The Celtics are going to be a team that wins a lot of games. That's already done. But the Warriors, I think, to people still feel like a team that's going to win a lot of games once Curry comes back. And I think that honestly showed through. And I think it showed through that Westbrook received very few votes. Yeah. And that, bear in mind, like, he's already been killing it statistically, like, to the degree that he can he didn't fool anybody. They all still didn't vote for him. And that doesn't have to be all the voters, but I just thought that was so important that the favorite got no support from a general media poll after having the start that he's had, like he's the big favorite and nobody wanted him and everybody couldn't really figure out who they wanted besides him, but nobody wanted him. That was like kind of the key. So I'm with you in terms of like, I think it's okay to take an approach against Westbrook. I can until proven otherwise, basically. I think there is a, a, very ingrained media perception here of you're not going to fool me again. Sure. You fooled me with the MVP. You're not going to fool me sure again. Did. I know you can get numbers. I don't buy it. Now, like I did look this up this morning. I think it's notable that Westbrook off the bench is actually a net positive net rating, which I was like, did not expect that to see that terrible number. team too for a team that um, doesn't win games. Yeah. yeah. They don't win games. That's the problem, right? It's like by, by, by your standard, which I think is an important one. You know, and that's why I think Brogdon is the safe pick. Like Brogdon's like the number that you can kind of yep. hold as your blanket and be like, the numbers are good enough. They're not as good as some of the others, but they're good enough. The team wins a shit ton of games. Brogdon, like, it's going to be annoying to me because I'm going to be like, if you know, the case will be like, well, I just thought he was the most impactful. He was so good off the bench for them. Like now you care about impact before right. it was Jordan Clarkson. Now you care about impact. Sure. Um, Ben Matherin's plus 2,300. I bet him yesterday. I do not understand this. Uh, by your notion of 47 plus, I get it. But let's kind of like, let's take this this kind of approach of this season parity's way up. Sure. Winning records are, are way down. So if we kind of, if we truncate everything downward, Indiana actually, when they get Halliburton back, they kind of profile as a team that could wind up 43 44 if they have a good end of the season and now it's like okay 44 for this is 47 we're within range there i i resisted betting matherin early in the season because i was like look eventually they're going to trade everybody and then he's going to start but now i don't think that that happens they have no incentive to they're too far ahead they can't catch anybody they can't catch orlando right you know definitely can't catch houston san antonio so if you can't catch you might as well play it out and if you're going to play it out your formula works. You don't trade healed. Matherin continues to come off the bench. To me, that's the number that I've circled as like, I don't, that number should is not, is not right. Like Benedict Matherin can't be, can't have gotten longer at plus 2,300 if they're not going to make a move to shake up his rotation. What do you think? Sure. I, I think, so the, I think you're right in this way. If we agree that Westbrook's price is fundamentally wrong on the surface, mm -hmm. like it's just wrong. And I, I want to be really clear because I think, you know, if we're talking about uh, the NFL playoffs are coming up this weekend, I think it's really arrogant to say, like, the Bills can't be five and a half point favorites against the Bengals. It's like, well, there are tens of millions of dollars flooding into this market that's like shaping this number. And like, I know you don't think that the Bills can be a five and a half, but like, this is kind of like, this is the price that we have. And it's really smart and it's really efficient. And it's really unlikely that if you bet into these playoff markets, you're going to beat them. Right. Awards don't work like that. Uh, the prices can be fundamentally wrong for a really long time. And if we ever talk about MVP, that would be the perfect example of how prices for weeks can be wrong. 
and it's just not a reflection of what's actually going to happen at the end of the year, the the slow speed with which Jokic eventually became the favorite is proof of this, that forever and ever and ever and ever to start the year, it just, it, the number, the market was resistant to move and you could just bet and bet and bet and bet and bet and it just didn't change. And I think if you bet Jokic, you're going to end up being proven right because I think he's very likely to win again. So we can say something with six man that all of that means that we can look at the Westbrook price and it's okay to think it's nuts. Like it's okay to, I'll slip in the back in the, it's okay to think it's fucking crazy that he's minus money to win this award. And I can look at that and at least be a little confident I could be right as opposed to like an NFL point spread or something. So it, to get to your Matherin question, if we agree that that price is nuts, that Westbrook is not even close to that likely to win the award, the media poll reflects that he's not that close to that likely to win the award. They're not going to play that much better the rest of the year where he's that much more likely to win the award. If that's true, then everyone's price is wrong. Then Brogdon's wrong. Then Poole's wrong. Then Powell's wrong. Then Matherin's wrong. Uh, Malik Monk's probably not wrong because he's not even the sixth man anymore. But like, there's there's a right. couple other prices. Like Portis is wrong, but he's never going to win. So like, there everything can be wrong if Westbrook is wrong. So like, you're 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 correct. Like Matherin should be a lower price, and so should like I think Brogdon should be the favorite to win the award. He's not even close to the favorite. Yeah, when he's it's like who's and this relates to Matherin too. My last point would just be, it's like, whose flaw do you think the voters can stomach the most? So like Brogdon's flaw is he doesn't score as much as the other guys. Do you think they can stomach that because he plays for such a good team? Matherin's flaw, he has two. One, he's a rookie and there's an inherent bias there. He can win has happened, but like there's a little bit of a bias there versus more veteran players. His second flaw, so maybe he can overcome that, right? Second flaw is how good is the team going to be? And depending on when Halliburton comes back, what do I make them right now? I make them a 40 win team right now. And that's my projection for them. And it's going to kind of depend on a couple things, right? Like moves and Halliburton and all this stuff. Okay. If they can get 40 to 44, now you can overcome the second flaw too. He could play for a 44 win team. He scored his, he has an advantage over other players. He scores more than all the other contenders basically. Yeah. So his raw scoring average is helpful. So again, it's kind of just like, can voters stomach whatever your flaw is? Yeah, Matherin has two of them. Yes, they can be overcome. To me, Brogdon's is like the easiest because it's like he scores one point per game or two points per game less than everyone else, but they're going to win 68 games or what I mean, not 68, but they're going to win a lot of games. And, you know, if they win 60 games, I think I make them 59 right now. I don't think it's going to matter that he averages 13 and someone else averages 15 or he averages 14 and someone else averages 16. I think this will be like an attempt to honor that accomplishment of that team with like a guy who was like an acquisition that is obviously a key player off the bench. So you're not wrong about Matherin. I would prefer other players, but I think the good news for all of us, honestly, is whoever you like, if Westbrook's price is wrong, then there's like an opportunity here yeah. basically for whatever you come up with. Yeah. I think that's a great way of putting it. You've got me thinking now based off of the win percentage thing of kind of reframing it. Cause I've always, I've always been, been beholden to it's guys that score. It's guys that come off the bench and they get buckets. Right. Well, it's both. But, right. but, it, well, and here's what's interesting about the tie between the two. Okay. Is instead of it being like, start with guys that score and then weed out for, for guys that score a lot on, on good teams. Right. For like go the other way, which is guys that are the best player on really great teams and on really great teams, the best way to hold up a bench is to have one guy score a lot, right? Because on a really good team that's going to win a lot of games, you're going to have contracts. You're going to have, like, the Nuggets have $100 million in their starting five. It's like $150 million in their starting five. So you're, but inherently, your bench is going to have less. But if you still have a good bench, it's likely because one guy is able to score a lot, so like that kind of reframes the idea of it, which I think is like an interesting kind of reframing of, of the concept. Um, it says you want to do the other awards. I I'm do. going to go ahead and. I, and, I would say too, just to six man real quick. So Matt, it sounds like Matt, you know, cause I, I always like to, I didn't used to talk like this, but it's like radio talk. Yeah. I always feel like you, you should always end by like, or start by doing something really straightforward. So sure. it sounds like Matherin is your favorite bet of the prices right now, right? People want like actionable stuff usually a lot of the time. So you like, if you had to bet any price on the board, you would bet Matherin right now. Is that yes. why I have that right? Okay. Yeah. If I if I had to bet any price on the board, I would bet Brogdon by far over everyone else and hope that like a lame candidate can kind of win. And I just, I don't know if anyone else is going to end up making any sense. 
Uh, yeah, I think I think you're right on on that. And I may just like I may narrow it down to Mather and Brogdon because I still think I think at the end of the year with Jordan Poole that there will be a like a stat will get distributed, which I thought about yep. putting out today, which is here are Jordan Poole's numbers when he starts, and here's Jordan Poole's numbers when he actually comes off the bench. And those two numbers are not the same. Right. Bench numbers are way, way. And how many starts is he gonna have? Yeah. And he's at he's at 22. Yep. We played a little more than half the year. He's at 20, the most ever. Why when I say ever, I'd looked at I think since 2000, because like I don't going far back actually becomes counterproductive at some point because the league just was so fundamentally different. Lamar Odom started the most by far of any guy that won, and I think he was 31. And like we're almost there not almost there nine starts away, but we have half a season left. Clay's going to get a lot of like rest days. Is Curry definitely going to play every game? Like pool's going to, I, what is a realistic number? So the Warriors have played 40, what 44, 45 games. I think something like that. He's played pool has started 22. What do you think is a, like, if you set the over under a number of starts, Jordan pool has at the end of the year, and let's use the Lamar Odom number for like, if he's over that, it would be the most ever for a winner. And if he's under that, he's like, whatever, in range or something. So let's say 31 and a half. Yeah. You think he goes over 31 and a half starts or under 31 and a half starts? I'll say under at 30, but that was the number. Barely that was like 30 right. is like 30 even four games for Steph, four games for Clay the rest of the way. So then it's like, do they win enough? Because yeah. again, so he has flaws. Can those be overcome? Basically, yeah. there's no perfect candidate. That's what makes it so fun. There's no perfect candidate this year. There's not even close to a perfect candidate this year the idea that like look at the players that we're talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know right like the, the perfect candidate is norman powell it's just the clippers can't win that's the exactly. problem he's averaging yeah. enough points now they just stink and it's brutal and i honestly feel like he would be the guy that would win in like an, an easy situation if they were just good but they're not going to be good but they're not good <laughs> then that's the problem yeah. um let's well, talk about most improved so Lori market and now the favorite minus uh -huh. 110 i have to i have to think this is a handle move that this is not a, a shift in perception like there has to have been money that came in on Lori because I can't understand why Lori I can't understand why what what has happened in two weeks for Shea to now be plus 125 from a minus number and Lori to be minus 110 from a plus number Do you I agree uh, I have a really strong opinion on this okay uh raise your hand if you flooded the market with Lori marketing money like in the last couple of weeks Just raise your hand if you that. so um I have and a lot Barkley's of the one that moved it no, well, no, Maybe. most places, no. Uh, a couple places, yes. Most, uh, you know, sometimes it's just like, you know, you kind of have a feel for like what's going on and who's betting what. Some, I mean, honestly, like a lot of the domestic books are hyper aggressive now, night to night with the NBA. Not with other sports, this isn't true, some, but NBA, they're hyper aggressive. Like a star is having a huge game. Like, they are knocking down that price as the game is going on. Yeah. They're knocking down the price. And it's not just because they're taking money, like something has fundamentally changed. And they now usually it's an overreaction, but like you can appreciate the attention to detail of not just leaving an award market up uncovered, basically, right. to be bet into. You know, I remember when Embiid was having all those huge games, when Luca had the 60 point triple double, all that stuff. I mean, hyper aggressive with moving these things. My opinion on most improved has been I've been against SGA the whole time. I have zero dollars on SGA to win. And I was, you know, obviously like originally I had some on Halliburton. I had some on Markinen through about two weeks. So I was Halliburton before the year, Brunson before the year, Markinen two weeks in. And then I just stopped because it was really obvious what was happening that like SGA was this kind of like market force and maybe he could win. It would require a significant points per game average, but everybody got really wrapped up in this. And I just, I looked at the history of the award and I go, maybe he's this edge candidate that's so different, but can still win, right? Like you think about most improved, it's almost always someone that's like good, but pretty mediocre, taking a, a reasonable, like big step forward. And we can kind of define what like good and mediocre is like John Morant won. And he wasn't mediocre. He was good. He was just young, but like kind of just good-ish to really good, like that's the step. And I think with SGA, the problem that everyone's always had, at least like the people that I talk to is 
was he good? He already averaged like 26 points a game in a season. Like that's already really good. And I know he didn't make the all-star team. And that's going to be like the thing that the counter argument, well, it's always about non all-star to all-star, but he was kind of like an honorary all-star. He averaged like 25, 26 points per game. Yeah. He didn't make the team, but like, didn't he already have like the leap kind of already happened. Like it kind of, I think that's what the argument always was. So I just like, didn't bet, didn't bet. Cause I'm like, man, Maybe I'm wrong. I just, he doesn't make sense versus who normally wins. He's just a weird candidate, but maybe there's nobody else. You know, he could, of course, like firsts are made all the time. He could be the first guy to win doing this, going 26 to 31 points per game. Just the weirdest jump that never happens. And usually that guy's already made an all-star team anyway, but I was really like pretty aggressive in thinking that I really don't think this is the guy. I don't know who the guy is but I don't think this is the guy. And while he was going on this run, Markinen just kept killing it. Just like absolutely kept killing it and got better as the season went on. Like his last 15 are better than the previous 15. The stat lines are actually getting better, which is remarkable for a player like him. And then you, you, when you ever, you get the first glimpse of public sentiment, that's always the thing I think is the most interesting. And you've had a couple former players and current players tweet that he is clearly the winner of the award. I quoted Bobby Portis's tweet in the article that I wrote the other day, where it's like, it's marking and not even close. That was last week. And then the Medina NBA.com poll and look like voters can be different. He didn't have to pull the perfect sample. Markinen easily defeated SGA. And that was like before he's had like the last couple of games that he's had. So you can kind of see where this is going, I guess would be my point is that I think there will be a lot of pushback to a player that's already been that good winning now he doesn't not that he can't win i've just i've always been against him i think marketing is even more likely than the prices that we see right now to win and i think jalen brunson might actually be the second most likely player to win i have a lot of him from various points in the season i actually think we might get to the end and it might be like maybe sga comes in third because there's just no one else and halliburton's hurt so maybe he can't come in third but like I think it's Markinen with a bullet, number one. Brunson, very outside shot if something happens to Markinen. And then SGA, like, I don't I don't know what the case is if voters already weren't buying what was, what's been happening the last few months. A little long-winded, but that's kind of my thoughts there. No, it's great stuff. I, I think, you know, for me, I think with Shea, um, one of the things I try and think about when I'm betting awards is what is this going to feel like the last week of March? Sure. And when voters get the ballots and they're like, ah, I have to actually decide on this. Okay, let's start doing some research. What's it going to feel like? And the key question for me is, are the Jazz still fighting every night for a play-in spot, trying to win games? Markinen has 27 in the game winner. Um, Is Shea shut down? Is Shea just like, yeah, he's got points. And like the Thunder had a little bit where they were like maybe making them within range, but they faded down the stretch. Is that going to be what it's like? Um, I was on with John Montobo last night from Vizen on Betstream. And he was talking about how the market had moved on OKC to make the play in tournament. There's like that number got cut in half almost overnight. Right. They're and good. so All there's obviously good. like, it's remarkable. Uh, yeah. yeah, like a market re there's, there's a market sentiment that like, Hey, OKC is not going to be garbage. Like they're going to be within range at the end of the year. Sure. Um, Utah, I'll say like talking to league people, still nobody knows like nobody. It, it is not like, no, I don't think they're selling. And it is not like, <clears throat> oh no, like they're definitely going to be trading guys. It is very much um, the the most, I think the most salient comment I got about it was the the offer they get for players is more important than their team season goals this year. So if the offers come in, that it's like, we can't say no to this in a vacuum, they'll do that deal versus like there's certain players that if you call and you offer them like a really good deal, if the team's like, yeah, but I need that guy for April. I need that guy for May. Like it is very unlikely that Memphis trades Brandon Clark. Cause they're like, we need that guy. Even if you offered something ridiculous. Cause you're like, I'm buying in on Brandon Clark as my star. Like they still would probably be like, eh, no, like I need that guy. Uh, so that's kind of like where the where that that market is um in terms of the trade market for Utah. I still kind of I still kind of think that Shea is gonna get a lot of attention. And one of the reasons is you mentioned the former players talking about him. Uh I just I look at the last couple of years of this award and 
jaw was more than good ish jaw was like wow what a spectacular player and then it right. was like wow jaw's like an mvp candidate and right. if if you took the thunder and you were just like let's let's pump them up to 45 wins projected like they were going to make 45 wins he would have to be included in the mvp conversation that luca is based off of like where, where both teams are at it's like once you get into that kind of conversation it's like okay and that fits it and i don't necessarily think that's right I think the big question here is whether whether most improved is fundamentally shifted. It hasn't like drastically changed. It's always been these kind of guys, but whether it's gone to this next level of you got to be like Brandon Ingram, Ja, like that level guy sure. to be there. Because I also think that Laurie's probably just like a ha- even with the numbers, Laurie's like a half step below versus Shea, who's really there. It's fascinating. I will agree with you on this point. Been betting Brunson in the last couple of weeks. Think Brunson's a great bet. If if the answer to well, which one of of Laurie and Shea and Halberton are going to be in playoff contention? If the answer is none of them, they're all going to have faded by the end of the season. Jalen makes a ton of sense here as 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 the best value on the board. Sure. So I, I think uh, a couple points that I think are interesting and maybe could help people make a decision. I don't view team success. So I, I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I, I just think it's important to note we have had a number of players win on terrible, not not mediocre teams, terrible teams. Yes, yeah. it's about six to seven examples in the last 25 years of teams, of players winning on teams that were under 500. I mean, like Kevin Love won this award. They yeah. won 20 percent, 20 percent of their games, 20 percent, and he won the award. So it's not a disqualifier. The way, like, if you've made the all-star team, that's a disqualifier. Like, you're not going to win most improved if you made the all-star game. Has never happened right. in the history of the award. No one that's ever made it. That's why the Zion smoke always made no sense in this award market. So, like, okay, you don't have to be on a good team. But to your point, Kevin Love, that's a year where, like, he's, the, like, there's an obvious guy who made a huge leap. So who cares if he's on a bad team this year? There's not that like these players are all going to have fundamentally good cases. So if you want to use it as a tiebreaker where there's like really good candidates all across the board, who is playing in those games? I think that's totally fine. I don't think that's like a, a bad approach or anything as a way to do it. I just, uh, you you know, you mentioned, okay, SGA is going to be in these games at the end of the year and, you know, maybe marketing's not whatever. I just, until the way I'm going to approach this, until I see any evidence that like the people who actually vote yeah. are favoring SGA over Markinen until I see that. Cause it's, we do this all the time. Like who do I think should win? And sure. I always make a really strong argument of just saying this betting these like talking about them is great. It's really fun. Betting these has nothing to do with who you think is going to win. It's entirely about, okay, the people who vote, the people who are actually deciding it, what are they going to do? Even if you think it's the wrong answer, like let's say they all decided Westbrook was going to win six man, even though that makes no sense to me, if they all told me they were going to vote, like all of them collectively came to my house, knocked on the door and said, we're all voting for Russell Westbrook. Like, what would I do? Be like, well, I'm not going to bet it because I think it should be Norman Powell. Like, of course, I'm not going to, I'm going to go bet as much money as I could possibly bet on Russell Westbrook. So until I, the, that's the thing about marketing over SGA. I, I think SGA is awesome. Who cares? Yeah. Like the evidence that we have so far is marketing. Like that's the evidence that we have so far. And there, Brunson hasn't been great enough long enough for that to like seep into any kind of voting or discussion about the award. But the good news with Brunson is there's so much time left for that to happen yeah. and for it to like the next poll or the next kind of cross section of how voters think that maybe Brunson could be a part of the conversation. I actually think Markinen is much more likely to win than SGA. And this isn't who's better. Yeah, It has nothing to do with who's better or who scores more points. Uh, my read on the situation is that Markinen seems more, much more likely to win. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not against this idea because he was. I was with you on the early season betting. Once I saw right. that the Jazz were not terrible, I was like, hammer, 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 hammer on, on Laurie. Um, so I'm with you on that. That's the good news. I, the only good news on, on versus six man where it's like, if it's Westbrook, I'm screwed. The only good news for me is on <laughs> most improved. Uh, yeah. It's like, I bet the, I've bet enough of the field where I'm going to be okay. At right. I know you were on SGA like a little bit. I just, I sat it out and maybe that's yeah. like to my fault. Maybe he's going to win hey, and I'm going to be like, all right, I, in, your, in your direction. I learned my lesson. Maybe yeah. I, maybe I'll learn my lesson or I won't. I don't, we'll see. Um, Finally, I want to skip ROI and DPOI because I've talked a lot about DPOI the last two weeks sure. and rookies boring. Right. It's um, Jaron unless he gets hurt. That's yeah. that's DPOI. Jaron, Jaron, Jaron unless he gets hurt and then it's Claxton. That's yeah. it. Um all right. So MVP. Um Yogi's just a freight train. Just yeah. 
and I got on him at the right time. I did course correct after being like, no way they give it to him three times in a row. Not happening. I got on it early enough at 1900 to be like, to at least be okay to, to make up for all the other positions. Um, I started getting it like early because I reached this point where I was like, if it's not Tatum, who's going to outlast everyone. And I was like, shit, it's going to be Jokic. He's just going to like truck his way through especially when I looked at how much my argument was, was March mostly built on look at the schedule Denver's home for two months. They were home all of December and all of January. They've had like five road games total in the last two months. Uh, now that's about to change and they're about to be on the road a lot, but now they're so good that they can take what they've built at home and take it on the road and be fine. Um, you know, Tatum, when I profile the type of voters, right. It's going to be the analysts and stack guys are all going to be like, it's Jokic. This is not a conversation. What are we doing? I think Luca will generate enough just based off of the sheer enormity of the numbers, just volume usage and the whole, like this team's garbage without him. My least favorite argument, but it is a thing that's used by some voters. Like some voters that like, Jokic won last year in part because a lot of people were like, look at this fucking team he's got. Again, hate that argument, but like you mentioned, can't bet based off of what I think about the argument. It's whether it's used or not, and it is. Um, the only value spot I think right now, like if you got in on if you haven't gotten in on Jokic, if you're gonna bet it right now, it needs to be Jokic. He doesn't miss games, knock on wood. Uh, he's a freight train. He's proven basically that he's gonna have enough nights of 10. 14, 16, balanced with 38, 9, or in the last two weeks, 30, 12, 10 to get there. Um, the the spot that I do see, though, and, and like, look, I keep waiting. The MB games played is the thing that I'm just like, ooh, like he's going to have to like play a lot down the stretch. And you just, it's, that's always the thing with him. But Tatum right now at FanDuel is plus 700. This was plus 600 earlier in the week. There is go there are going to be protest votes, I think, for Jason Tatum. Like, if the Celtics finish number one, if the Celtics finish with the top seed, there is enough of a enough with the vorps and schmorps in the voting block to where Tatum will at least get votes. It's not nearly enough to overtake the rest of the component. But if things were to get wonky, I do think right now, like if you're asking me what the best number on the board is, to me it's Tatum plus seven hundred. Okay. Uh there's a lot of good stuff in there. That was really good. That was, uh, I think that was a pretty thorough analysis. I agree with most of what you said. Um, it would be, you know, what would be an awesome market player most likely to come in second. Would so, so what really I want market. is I want MVP finishing position or like exactas, like, track yeah, and stuff. I want, I want the over under. Cause like, I would absolutely hammer Jason Tatum under three and a half. Like right. that would be something to come like, in any second. Juice, like, to come I'm in second, I would jam him to come in second. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I totally agree with you on that. Um, it's tough. Uh, I think that ta I've, I've, I've been pretty consistent the entire time. So first off, a really good lesson learned, I think, for both of us and for a lot of people about assuming voters won't do something. Yes. And then they'll just go ahead and do it. Rather than take the approach of like, I know you and I bet a bunch of Jokic. I've been betting Jokic for like a month and a half. But like, it didn't start that way. I started right. just as skeptical as everybody else was. And I was wrong. And I was really dumb to probably think yeah. that, honestly. Like, oh, well, like, they're never going to give it to him again for a third straight year. Okay. Like, look at this. You idiot. <laughs> and uh, and so, because, you know, like, let's be honest. There were 40s and there were 35s the week, first week of the season, second week of the season. Those were there. Could have bet them. Didn't yep. bet them. My bad. And uh, it's just a, an important lesson learned about making an assumption that you're not sure is rooted in, like, reality like what, what what if he's just the best player again he's clearly the best player in the league statistically whether he's the actual best player we can debate like him and Giannis and him and these other players whatever um what to bet so if there's a yoke some of the Jokic's are plus and now in some places some of the Jokic's are minus and I still think pluses are okay and they're not look you are not making the best bet of all time you're not buying the dip on anything like you're right. not this isn't going to age perfectly you don't I get think, to brag about it. 
Right. But like there are three three ways this turns out, probably, right? And I guess we'll do like the order in order of most likely. Uh path one, Jokic just wins and it's like a pretty easy vote, honestly. Uh if Denver and Boston are not separated by very many games, right now I have them separated by three and a half in the final standings. If that's about what it is, Denver 55, 56, Celtics 59, 60. I don't really think there's a Tatum case. So path one is like Jokic just wins. And I think that's like maybe like 60, 65% of the time. Yeah. I think path two is Celtics win 63 games, something outrageous, like a top 10, 15 all time season, 65, which is possible still, especially when Jalen comes back. And Denver doesn't. And then Denver wins like 52 games. They win something like Memphis gets the number one seed. Denver doesn't win very much. And then Luca's really good too. So like Jokic and Luca will kind of battle for statistical votes and Tatum will get a lot because my God, look how many games they won. That's a low probability event though, man. Like that's not happening a lot. And it's, I've never bet Tatum. I'm not going to bet Tatum until it seems way more likely that that's even remotely possible. I thought it was so compelling that the Celtics got off to this phenomenal start and Tatum got basically zero votes in the media poll. Yeah, that, that was interesting. Released, like almost zero. Think about it. It was that. leading in the straw poll from ESPN. Right? He was, which which is kind of interesting, right? Because it told you from the the Bontemps straw poll to the media poll, basically like Luca and Jokic flourished statistically, and Tatum kept doing the same thing, and they lost a little bit more. And so, like, well, look what happens when players flourish statistically, and how that affects. Yeah. who voters might end up voting for. I do think there's a path for Tatum, but I've always been pretty consistent that it's incredibly narrow yeah. and never, and basically never worth betting. Um, I, I always have a soft spot for Embiid. I like really want, I like want him to get one of these. It like would make me happy if he got one of these. I don't even know why, probably because I bet him every year to win the MVP and I'm an idiot, but like, I just don't know what the path is. I just don't like, he's probably not going to catch Jokic in any of like the metric categories, right? He's, he could come in second in all of them, which would be yeah. pretty crazy. He's third in a bunch of them right now. Jokic is first, the runaway winner in all of them. But like if him beats second in like PER win shares, all this stuff, like if him beats second in all of those things and Jokic is first in all of those things and the Nuggets win 55 whatever their average games is going to be 55 and the Sixers win less than that which is definitely their average does Embiid ever win even one yeah. percent of the time yeah. in that situation even playing every game the rest of the season maybe like five percent of the time because I don't know some kind of narrative develops just what is the path so like the Sixers um, the Sixers have to win have to win more games by margin more. like they have to go on like a bonkers run yeah like a Brooklyn run yeah, really, which they kind of already did because they did when Brooklyn was winning, they were winning a lot yep. and both those teams gamed on Boston and it still didn't matter. So I just, I, you know, there's no, I don't think there's a great bet to make. I would love to be able to make an Embiid case. I don't know what it is. I'd love to be able to make a Tatum case. Every time I do it, it seems like a one in 50 kind of a shot. Like he has to be like Steve Nash on the Suns, but then Jokic has to lose way more. And it's like, okay, well, Tatum's not the best statistically. He's not even close and he's not going to be close. Nope. It's just, can everyone kind of trick themselves into thinking that this is like a really good idea? I don't see any evidence of that. So again, not what I think is going to happen. I don't see any evidence of that happening yet. Yeah. And if we get some evidence that that seems more likely to happen, maybe the next straw poll from Bontemps is really close between Tatum and Jokic. That'd be really interesting. The if number being really relatively to... better doesn't necessarily make it a good bet because it's gone down for, it has like, it's not that the number has inexplicably gone down. It has right. very explicably gone down. Like, and where's it going to go? Yeah. Like, is you think Jokic is going to stop being a big favorite at some point? So, unless he gets hurt, which is yeah. path three, with I didn't mention the third path, um, which is that he get injured, he gets injured, and then someone else has to win because he's he's hurt, and then that's that's really the Tatum opening. And I don't, but I don't like to talk about injuries when it's like yeah. not a not a known injury that's already happened. Like his wrist is bothering him, but I don't think that's going to be. That's been at the same years. time, Tatum's hand is bothering him, and he says yeah. he might sit out some games to to solve that issue. So. I just it yeah. feels like, like from Jokic. a from a from a content perspective, if if Jokic got hurt, we could do hours on Luca versus Tatum and the idea yeah. of versus less Embiid. games, better stats, Tatum yeah. like good stats, better team. Like sure. it provides a real equilibrium. But right. but the problem is Jokic right now has both. Like my argument against Jokic coming into the year was not just the three time thing. It was look, 
he's got all these weapons now. His usage is going to go down. And guess what? It has. You look at Jokic's usage is way down. Doesn't right. matter. His efficiency <laughs> went up. He doesn't like, miss. Yeah, he never well, misses. And that's shots. and that's what's happened. Is like yeah. two two things yeah. concurrently. I, I, this is what I missed was. Well, yeah, he doesn't have the ball as much. Do you know what happens? He gets better looks because guys can't quadruple team him and he gets more assists because he has guys that can knock down shots now. So like, he's just, he's such a fucking beast, man. Um, Before I get you out of here, uh, and I appreciate you coming on, yeah. I do want to ask you about the Western Conference and conference futures. Now, I, I was on, on YBYB yesterday and I said, you know, I do kind of like to wait to see what the path is going to be. I want to see, I, I want to get a firmer sense of what the bracket's going to look like. And a lot of those are going to be, it's very di- difficult to determine. We don't, we don't know much now. Like what I would say is, I do not think it is likely that Denver and Memphis will see each other until the conference finals, if they see each other. I agree. Like I'm willing to go to that. Like that's the only thing at the top I'm willing to be like. Everything else is completely like, if you're like the Clippers got the third seed, I'd be like, wow, but okay. My Norman Powell tickets in good shape. Um, but if we look at that, that to me is the way to bet conference. Otherwise you should just bet title because it's one more path. Like I want to bet conference based off of, off of the path. Um, the markets has moved Denver finally to the top spot. They've finally given up the ghost and, and that FanDuel now uh, nuggets plus three sixty, warriors plus three seventy, which is a funny, like, you get 10 cents on this team that is way worse in every category. Memphis plus 480. I've explained like all of the reasons why Memphis is is never going to get the respect of the market until they look like they can actually score in the hat. Like I do think that like a lot of their underlying metrics are why this is not higher. It's not just that like there is there a market bias against Memphis? Yes. Like the bookmakers have said like we don't take money on Memphis because they're small. So the numbers are always going to be a little bit plus there. Um, they won't give up the ghost in the Clippers still plus five fifty. Pelicans plus eight fifty. Suns plus 1000. Uh, we can entertain Mavericks plus 1400 if we, if we want, but if, when you look at this market, what stands out to you as an opportunity in a West that is way more, usually we're like, wow, look at all these great teams. And in the West now we're kind of like, wow, no one's really awesome. Sure. I know you made a Dallas joke like we could entertain them. It's just worth noting if let's say like the Luke, do you think the Luca rumblings are true that he's like really wants the team to make a bunch of moves or do you think that was all gas? I think it's, oh yeah, I think it's absolutely true. Okay. So if we think that's true, I would say like, well, Dallas is live because they could fundamentally change the composition of their team potentially. And if they do that, then I need to evaluate what the new team is to be able to make, and they're close enough to all of the other teams that that's possible, but unless we, you tell me who the players are, I'm not going to be able to kind of figure out what we're supposed to do with Dallas. So they're live, but I, they're live in a really nebulous sense where I need to know who the new players are. In terms of the other teams, I'll draw a parallel between, like we all watched the Monday night football game between Dallas and Tampa, right? And the betting market for that game was so interesting because, and like, I, I it's not, like I bet Dallas, not even confidently, but like I bet Dallas in the game and part of like the my the way I was trying to think about the game was I was just like, all right, all season, Dallas is much better than Tampa, way better than this number, way better. But there's just this belief that because of basically who Tampa's quarterback is and that they were a little healthier, um, Dallas hadn't played great to close the season, but it seemed like this compression where it's like the teams were not separated by very much in the betting market was basically like, well, Brady will just figure this out. Yeah, just figure it out. They stink the whole year. They're never good. They never play well. All 17 games, they suck. and But they'll just figure this out. They'll just do it. And they didn't. Uh, and I feel like in NBA playoffs, there have been historical examples where it's like, you know, like honestly, like the LeBron Lakers when they lost to Phoenix. Now Davis gets hurt and there's like a lot of stuff going on there. But like teams that, well, like when they get to the playoffs, it'll just be okay. And they'll just like figure this out. I would be really, 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 really worried about the Warriors and the Clippers right now. I'd be extremely concerned about both of them. And the market is rating them the same as the teams that I wouldn't be as concerned about, which would be Memphis and Denver. And I'm curious if like another Brady situation, I guess would be the right way to put it, comes up with Golden State, where like usually winning on the road or the lack of winning on the road would be the right way to put it, should be a giant flashing red light 
against postseason success. Nobody's ever won the NBA title being under 500 on the road in the last like 40 years. It's never happened. And they're going to be way under 500. It's almost impossible that they're not way under 500. You can be like, well, Curry didn't play a while. And you're right. Also, other teams that won the title had injuries periodically during the season, and they managed to be okay. They yeah. managed to still win games on the road. So, like, I'm curious if when the Clippers are a little different because they never won anything, but we think of them like, well, yeah. in the playoffs, they'll be a thing. But with both those teams, it's like, maybe they're just not very good. Maybe the Warriors are just not very good. And it's okay that that's a, like, that's okay that they could just not be very good too, by the way, that clay is just like a step backwards and they're never going to get the bench. Right. And it's like all Curry all the time. And like, at some point that just doesn't work anymore to the degree that it has previously. Like that's, it's okay to think that. And I wonder if we're going to have Dallas Tampa in a similar situation in the playoffs with Memphis and golden state or with Denver and golden state where it's like, this team's never lost in this situation ever in the history of the play they've never lost a series in this kind of a situation and it's like but it, but they they've also never been this bad on the road and they've right. never had this many warning signs statistically that they've had during a season i'm curious if we get the same setup obviously in that situation that would mean like i like memphis and denver basically as yeah. some kind of pairing yeah and i think if golden state this number is is priced at plus 370 which to me is more telling of if Golden State's get there, like they're there, they're here at plus 370 with this terrible of a regular season. So if they make the playoffs because they go on a little bit of a run just to get themselves clear, it means that in the playoff series, the books are absolutely like I was I'm saying this on Memphis radio this morning. I was like, Memphis will probably be a dog to Golden State, like in the series price. Because I can't imagine, I cannot imagine them being willing to be like, Yeah, we'll give you plus money on Golden State to win a series versus Memphis. Um, uh, now will they be a dog. Yeah, I be a dog. I think, think Memphis I, will be a dog at home, not in the game series price. I think Memphis will be favored in like game one. So it'll be like a 50 50 kind of a series price. Yes. Cause I, I think about like Suns Lakers would be a really good example. From yes. A few years ago. Uh, Nets Celtics would yes. be a really good example from last year. Like the hype team versus the successful team basically yep. and the hype team always gets a ton of credit and not sometimes it's deserved like those are two examples where the good team yeah. won but it doesn't have to work like that um it can be different i yeah i could see that like a, a very, like, very i don't think let me, let me put it this way if it's a two seven that's different than if it's a if it's a two three or if it's a like a second one, round like and a they've one already five. Beaten someone golden yeah. state's already defeated someone that like looked pretty good probably yes. in beating the Kings, right? Or so, whatever, if it's two seven it's Memphis Golden State, then yeah, Memphis is favored. It could just you can't get past the differential there. Um, if, if Memphis and Denver played, and I offered you, well, I, you have to know who's at home. I guess it's a bad example. Whoever is at home is going to be favored. I was going to say if it was Memphis Denver, and I offered you like pick on a neutral for a series, who would you take? Denver. You have to understand. I, I am Memphis. never going to be on. I, I, I'm never going to be on Memphis because they okay. cannot score in the half court. They're 26, and this is a big number for sure. me. It always is, and it it comes into play when I think about the actual matchups, which is like, um, Memphis got killed by Denver in Denver. Desmond Bain didn't play, so you could just be like, well, Bain didn't play. Right. I'm like that 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 matters, but you got to understand what happened was they blitzed on side pick and rolls versus Jaw. He splits it because that's an, and like, there are so few guards that can split those effectively. And jaw was just like, like an L just whoop, and gone, right. <laughs> just blipped like mega man. Sure. And he gets to that middle, but then he gets to the middle and he, he drives into Jeff green for a charge instead of just like a wide open baseline J with two guys behind him wide open. And he's a great passer. It's not even that it's like some guys it's that. But it's just like there are very specific limitations to what Memphis can do. And over the course of a series, it gets harder and harder to sustain your transition attack, especially versus a team. The other problem is like Denver's offense is so unstoppable and has so many counters. You are taking the ball out of the basket every single time, like not every single, but like enough for them to get their half court defense set. So you're going into half court defense. You know, your opportunities to run. Now, you can run off the turnovers. That works. But yeah, I would definitely, I would have Denver in that series and I would be taking them like, okay. I would be finding do you, all do you agree with me on Golden State? Like, do you think they're pho phony is the wrong word because they've won so much? Do you think this year's team is phony? I want to see what they do at the deadline. Sure. Um, 
Curry. My hesitation is this, is that the advanced numbers for the starting lineup when whole are still so good. Yeah. And I just keep coming back to if the problem is all of those regular season minutes that you have to play because you can't play guys 35 plus, if that's the problem, then they really are like a different animal in the playoffs. The comparison has been to the, I think it was the O, is either O1 or O2 Lakers. Okay. Um, it had to be the O1 because O2 was the, um, was the, the King series, but it was that team that was like garbage and then just like swept the Western conference. I don't, I think the West is better than that this year. So I don't think that that's a case. Like, I think that's a bad comparison. Like that was a weak time in the league. The Lakers took advantage of it. You know, a lot of things that were in play there. Well, if I could compare it, because I, I think I think it's the O2 Lakers. I don't have the O1 Lakers up here. I have the O2 one up. They were not particularly good on the road, but they still won 59% of their road games. Yeah. They were they blitzed the league the first month of the season, basically. They didn't lose in November almost. And then they were like a 55, 60% team for like 40 games, something like that, which probably I think to your point, maybe coasting. Yeah. a little bit something like that but he, again think of the comp though like let's say you're right let's say the o2 lakers was the team that, which i think it is is the team that you were thinking of that team won almost 60 percent of their road games they blitzed the league the first month of the season the warriors did neither of those things they didn't yeah. even come remotely close so like again i loved i i bet on the warriors a bunch throughout this run i didn't bet on them in the finals last year that was my bad but i bet on them a ton besides that and had a lot of success I think this I think it's kind of phony. I I think this is I think this might be Brady against the Cowboys and it's like so, well they got it. It's like what if they don't got it? If this is like a, a changing of the guard year. If this is a real rollover. If this is essentially 2015, right? Where like right. the Warriors came out. If this is a new if this is a changing of the guard year. This gets really interesting because I made the joke about the Mavericks being live. Right. Denver fans have asked me who should we be worried about in the playoffs and I've told them you need to be worried about Dallas. Sure. Because Luca's isocentric style really messes with Denver defensively, and Denver's ability and Dallas's ability to play pushed out to the perimeter challenges a lot of the movement that Denver wants to run offensively. So, like that's a challenge. Then you have the fact that Dallas absolutely destroys Memphis. That's a bad matchup for Memphis. It has been every single time. I bet okay. Dallas every matchup that they get. So Dallas, you like, you like come full circle, and even I've come full podcast. circle. Yeah, eventually, or not full circle. You like 180 actually, because you were yeah. like, "Well, Dallas, ha 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 ha." And now we're at the end of the podcast, and you're like, "So by Dallas, so, so by Dallas." Dallas. Yeah. yeah, but but the other one here, I think honestly, if we are saying that if it's not going to be, if if you're just if you came from the future and we're like, "Nope, the Warriors actually were bad." You hope the Clippers actually were were garbage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Suns imploded. If you're just like those three teams are out, Good okay, are are established too. teams, the yeah. the the old money in the Western Conference, sure. Like I do keep, if, if you remove the experience factor, now I'm like, all right, now I can see the Pelicans making a run. Like if I don't have to worry about Pelicans on the road in a game six versus Kawhi, Steph or Devin Booker. Okay. Sure. Now I can start to start to see the Pelicans making a run. Cause that's been my hesitancy with the Pelicans post. Cause right now it's honestly like they're too low now. Cause I'm like, well, yeah, like their record has slipped. They're without their two best players as good as their overall team is. Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson objectively matter a lot here. So that, sure. that's where I get to. Is there anybody that you would kind of identify as like a, a value bet right now in the West? Well, I mean, if if you thought Dallas was going to upgrade significantly, how how could it not be Dallas? I mean, that's yeah. just uh they're so close statistically to like what a title team looks like right now. They're not they're not there yet, but they're they're very close. So my concern, I think, is that. Somebody noted this on Twitter. Two of the moves have been rumored for them, which were Levert, and then there was another move that they were talked about. They were both sounds they were, terrible. They were both cost saving moves. Oh no! Yeah. So Cuban, th- we're penny pinching. So this might shark, be like a tension point. Syndication's not going so great. What's going? Well, let's on? either that or it, it legitimately could be like the front office being like, "Well, we want to make another run at free agency, so we have to like tick away. We have to like chip away right. at." Our oh, cap. This title, you can get this title. This one's up for grabs. How two years from now? How do you know it's not something else? Like but, this is this one's open. Like this one's way open. Oh man, I think you gotta go. like your. I agree. Your Denver, but again, we, Dallas, we get to, like, you gotta go for this one. We get yeah. to like what they should do versus what they will do. So like that's the question. Sure. Is, and that's the other thing I will point. say is their 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 cache of assets 
this this market's gonna be really weird. We've seen guys get good players for nothing. Like the Blazers got Jeremy Grant for nothing. Right. But then on the other hand, we see like Rudy Gobert and Drew Holiday went for five picks a piece. Right. DeJounte Murray went for four. Oh, Gobert. The best. And the best. You know, I'll tell you, like, like who are the teams that have impact guys where they're willing to trade? And everyone goes, Toronto. And I'm just telling you, like, I every any GM that would ask me, like, hey, like uh, they would did not do this, but they were like, What do you think about a move for Tor- with Tor- with for the for you know a- a- Siakam or OG right. or like whoever? I would just be like, you are not going to come out ahead in this trade. Right. You will think that you are, and then you will get to the end of it and realize that realize that Masai got the better end of it. Like under no circumstances should you do this. But the starting point here is more that Dallas literally does not have Dallas doesn't have the assets to make a bad trade for OG and Anobi. That's God, the best way. Okay, to put it. they're not but even that. in the conversation. Like the phone right. gets hung up because it's like, well, what do you have? And they're like, we have meh and it's like hey how about tim hardaway jr josh green and a first how about that how about about click how about that so yeah i just the i think my last point oh yeah we went way over all right so i I probably gotta go after this my my last point would be so like i think a lot of people might listen to our answer on the warriors Uh, especially not the clippers really they're just whatever the warriors though like a team that's had a sustained run of success that is in kind of a low point And people are going to be like, well, in sports, usually that team like responds and that team like starts playing better. Like, you know, how many times did like the Brady Patriots get off to bad starts in seasons or like, you know, Mahomes didn't make the Super Bowl last year, which you obviously know, but like in the middle of the year, they weren't rated as well. And they kind of went on that big run in the second half of the season. So I think people always think that the turnaround's coming for the awesome team or the historically awesome team in all sports. And usually it does, right? I guess my my point would just be, like, if you're thinking that, like, wow, these guys are, like, overreacting so much, put the Golden State Warriors in a playoff series, they got it. Like, you could be right, just that all of the other examples of, like, the great historical team figuring it out and, like, taking a step forward and, like, winning another title and continuing the run, they never look as bad as the Warriors look right now. Sure. They don't look this bad. They don't, and it's way, it's not like it's close, way different way different than like other historically good teams at least at this point 20 games maybe i'll come back on it'll be different curry plays all 20 maybe they win all 20 but right now like it is a giant flashing stop sign more than with other historically good teams thanks for joining us on buckets really appreciate ken barkley for stopping by make sure to check out you better you bet monday through friday awesome show it's got podcasts check those out if you want you can catch them live on the odyssey app make sure to follow ken on twitter at locky lockerson Also, make sure to subscribe to the chalkboard. It's absolutely phenomenal. Ken, thanks so much for coming on. No problem, Matt. Thanks for having me. We'll see you guys again next time. Monday, we'll be back with Albert Wynn for your weekend recap. Have yourselves a great weekend. Till then, let's get buckets.